Hey, since the dawn of time, people have wondered about the meaning of life and asked this big question, what's on the other side of death? Most religions have described some kind of answer to this, the kingdom of heaven or nirvana or something of that nature. And what if they're all right? What if every answer about this ethereal realm on the other side could not only be known, but verified? Well, one of the best ways to know about what's on this other side are to hear the testimonials that come from others who have been there themselves. This is what I wanna share with you today. As you might know, we've been working more closely with Gaia lately. Today, I wanna to share with you this really amazing clip that they have from one of their new shows, Renaissance. This show is incredible and features a series of amazing interviews from people who have actually passed on, saw the other side, and then came back. And what they had to say was seriously groundbreaking. While we're working on a fresh new slew of content for you, I wanted to take a moment to pop in and share with you this clip of one person who had a near-death experience named Vinny Tolman, who had some amazing things to share about his experience on the other side. Get ready, this story is probably gonna change your world. In fact, the entire show is absolutely amazing. I must say, if you don't have a Gaia account yet, use the link in the description to get access to the show and watch it right away. You won't be disappointed, promise. My name is Vinny Todd Tolman, and before my near-death experience, as a youthful, young 20-something-year-old, I was, I was out exploring life. I'd traveled the world, done many different jobs, and I used to do bodybuilding or amateur bodybuilding. And back in January 18th, 2003, it started with a new supplement that me and a really good friend of mine had purchased online. We decided, hey, we're gonna take this on a Saturday. We're gonna go up and see a car show, do a workout at the gym, and, and just have a fun Saturday. So we get there to hit my buddy's place. We took this new supplement and immediately felt something was wrong. It felt almost as if cold ice started pumping through our veins. It, it felt like our whole body was starting to get cold. And I explained to my buddy that, hey, we should probably go get something to eat. Otherwise, we're gonna be really sick. So we went down the street a few blocks to this fast food joint. We go in there, and as soon as I go in, I went straight into the bathroom. I, I felt like I was gonna throw up or vomit. My buddy, he went in, he collapsed on the first booth he could reach, and he started to throw up. He started to vomit on the, on the table. The manager of the restaurant called 911, they got him hauled away in an ambulance almost immediately, right away. And he, he turned out to be totally fine. They released him from the hospital the very next day. But meanwhile, me inside that bathroom, I myself start to vomit while I'm passed out on my back. And what happens is when you vomit on your back like that, you aspirate, you suffocate. And that's what happened to me. I, I died right there and then on the, the bathroom floor. I suffocated. And about 45 minutes later, the manager of the restaurant finally opened up that bathroom after a customer kept asking him to open it for him. He opened it and sees this dead body on the ground. He called 911 and, and from my point of view, I went directly from consciousness to feeling dizziness as if the room is spinning on me. And then out of nowhere, I'm watching, I'm just watching this scene unfold in front of me and I'm watching a dead body on the ground. I'm watching a manager call 911. I'm watching even the customer asking to have the manager open the door. And it's very weird and odd to me because I can hear every thought in anyone's head that is near me. And I'm watching everything from above, which was also very odd to me. But it didn't dawn on me that this dead body I was seeing was me because the body didn't look like me. The neck had actually already swollen wider than the jaw. There was very, very pallid purple and yellow tones on the skin. It didn't look, it, it almost didn't look human. And I, I didn't think for a second that that was me because me was up here watching what was going on. I watched them bag this body when the ambulance comes. They pronounce it dead. They put it in a body bag. They put it on a gurney 
and they put it in the back of the ambulance. Meanwhile, the, the other medics, there's three medics that show up. There's a rookie who's brand new. He's sitting in the back with the, the body. The other two are out getting paperwork done. And I could feel his dismay because he felt like I wanted to be a, a, a medic. I wanted to be an EMT to make a difference. And he felt that he wasn't making that difference. He felt that these veteran medics didn't try for very long to resuscitate the body. He felt they should have tried for 20 minutes, not just five minutes. And they're going down the street as they pull away from the scene. I see this glow start to form and it really looked like a little miniature sun starting to glow in the heart space on the rookie medic who's sitting in the back of the ambulance. I see it start to glow and it got brighter and brighter. And then I heard very loudly, this one's not dead. I didn't know where that came from, but I definitely heard it and I could tell that the rookie medic heard it too. Now he froze, he kind of froze as soon as that was said, but he didn't do anything about it. I could, I could hear him shrugging it off as, that must have just been your imagination. But they went another block down the road and the light started to glow even brighter. And I heard for a second time, this one's not dead. And on that second time, he responded, he reacted. He unzipped the body bag. He undid a couple of straps that are around the body so that he could reach in and feel around the neck area for a pulse. He didn't feel a pulse but it didn't stop him, he kept going. He was gonna attempt resuscitation. So he forced oxygen into the lungs. He hooked up uh, the body to a defibrillator. Well, the alarm is going off and the other two medics start just yelling at him saying, you're gonna get fired. You gotta stop this, stop what you're doing. You're desiccating a dead body, this is illegal. But he didn't care, he went ahead and, and let the first charge happen and nothing happened after the first charge. He went ahead and let it recharge for a second time and they were still chewing him out. But when the second charge happened, there was one single heartbeat. It allowed the other two medics to wait and watch. They knew he was gonna go for a third round. And right after, within seconds of that third charge, there was a steady but faint heartbeat. So the team began resuscitation procedures of injecting things and doing all sorts of things for the body but the body was having a really hard time with coming back. It was going into seizures and they were strapping the body down. I was watching the strapping going on. I didn't feel anything until they got to the left arm. But when they strapped the left arm, I'm left-handed, I felt them strapping my left arm. And this was the first inkling, the first idea that what I'd been watching this whole time was my very own death. This is when I went to essentially the darkest place I've ever gone in my life. I had such an, an ego voice going, saying, you're such an idiot. How could you not know that what you've been watching this whole time was your own death? How could you not know that? And as I started to feel that and think that, I then started to see in very quick flashes all the negative influences I had on other people in my whole life the things that I did to hurt people on accident or on purpose. I saw it not just through my eyes, but through their eyes, how it impacted them. And I started to feel this voice coming out of me saying, you're not worth saving. Look at all of this bad that you've done in your life. But then all of a sudden in the same speed, I started to see all the good that I did. And there was a lot more good than I had ever done, way more and I saw how much change I was able to impact people's lives in good ways. And this love started to pour over me from behind me. But it's so hard to describe in words because it's a love that we don't have here. It's an unconditional, pure love that doesn't exist in this space. At least that we can really, really feel like there. And this love poured over me and this love, it had such a profound effect on me. I had a, a pretty rough upbringing. I had some darkness inside of me and this love flushed it out, sealed it up, made it whole. And all of this is happening. I'm realizing that all of this love and this light and this energy is coming from behind me. And I can see a man standing behind me. 
with very pink skin, very long white beard. He has long white hair. His eyes could pierce you. They could look through you and they could essentially know not who you thought you were, but who you really were. And my first thought was, are you God? And this gentleman just laughed. He said, no, I'm not God. Then my follow-up question was, you must be Jesus then. Even though you don't look like Jesus, you must be Jesus. And he laughed at that as well and said, no, son, I'm not Jesus, but I'm, I'm here for you. I'm here to be your guide. I'm here to help you go wherever you want to go. And he showed me, he motioned, I could go back to my life or I could go forward with him and he could show me what's next for me, what's next in line for my life. And of course, I didn't want to go back to the body. There was no question because the body to me meant mistakes. It meant failures. It meant pain. It meant struggle. And so far, everything that I felt from this gentleman was absolute peace, unconditional love and energy and power that was coming from him. And I wanted that. I wanted more of that. Whatever that was, that's what I wanted. So I told him, I want to go with you wherever you're going. That's where I want to go. And he explained to me that, that we were going to start a journey. This journey was going to be from a lower understanding and a lower density to a much higher frequency and a much higher understanding that we weren't just going to travel from space to space, but we're going to travel from dimension to dimension, from low dimension to high dimension. And as we're doing that, I had to raise my frequency. I had to raise my dimensional vibration to be able to match his to keep going with him. I had to fully embrace these major principles to get where we were going to go. I would have thought that the first principle was going to be love, but it wasn't. The first principle was authenticity, that I had to realize that all of us are not authentic in this world, that the most authentic people in our world, in this earthly life, are the very young and the very old, is because they have nothing to lose and nothing to gain by being inauthentic. And he explained to me that through this life, we put different facades on the outside of us we put different masks on for different people. And that I needed to get to a point where I could be the same person no matter who I was around. And that was actually quite hard for me. I didn't realize that I had put on so many masks. And he helped me one at a time, peel those all away and start building cleanly on a new foundation. And, and that's what he did with authenticity. Then he, he brought me to understand the purpose of life, why we come here. I was taught something very different in my church and in my, in my upbringing. I was taught more that we're here to be proven and to be tested. But it was very clear that our life here is not a courtroom, but a classroom. That we're here to learn, to grow, to exercise the power of creation, and that as we existed in heaven before here, anything God wanted, we wanted instantly. And that for us to really grow, it's just like earth. We had to leave home. And it was scary. We had to go through a veil of forgetfulness because that love is so strong and so powerful that even the remembrance of that love would prevent us from having true free agency. We would still be making decisions out of obligation of that love because again, that love is so powerful. And one of the most important things I learned was to master my thoughts because truly our thoughts themselves create. They end up becoming who we are. They become our character and where we go in our life. And it's so important for us to come from an energy of love with our thinking, especially when we think about ourselves. It amplifies whatever we desire that we want to create. And that brought me all the way to where I was seeing this vast planet. And it was surrounded by this almost like a cloud mist. But what was odd to me is I looked around and I could not see a sun. 
And I was, I was led to know through my guide, his name is Drake. Drake led me to know that this, this space was lit from within. So the light in this space of heaven, it comes from within everything. That's why there, there's so many colors we don't have here. Because the actual existence of light is different. Because everything glows there, everything. And when I say glow, I don't mean like glow in the dark glow. I mean glow like our sun glows. And to even bring a single blade of grass here to our earth, it would explode it because there's so much energy in a single blade of grass there. And we're at such a low density here that we couldn't vibrate at that such high frequency. We would be incinerated just to bring that here. That's why there is this tunnel or this journey that we have to go through for us to get to heaven is we have to really ramp up our, our frequency to be able to get there. And as I did, I touched down, I got into heaven, I got to feel the grass. Again, the grass was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen in my entire existence. The grass had a distinct, loving music frequency coming from it. Just to even be near it, you would feel connected to everything in heaven. It was such a beautiful experience. And as I'm, I'm literally glowing in this space, I'm feeling the connectedness of the grass and, and all the plants and the, and the water and the healing power of this water. When my guide, Drake, he pulls me aside and he says, Vinny, this is going to be very hard, but it's going to be worth it. And out of nowhere, I start hearing my brother's voice, my brother from earth. I hear his voice as loud as he's speaking in my own ear. And I hear him giving a special prayer. Now, meanwhile, I've been in a coma. I've been brain dead for three days. And my brother is standing over my body and giving me a love that I didn't know he had for me as he said this prayer over me. And he finished with the sentence, I bless you to be made whole. Here I was in heaven, I finally felt whole. But this blessing to make me whole, it actually tore me away from there. And right before I was taken away, I got this amazing hug from Drake. I got to feel and understand the cosmos. I got to feel and understand what all of this means. Why we're here, why there's time, why there's struggle. I learned it all and I was just poured love. Love that I never deserved. Love that, that I still strive to be worthy of today. And it was just a pristine experience to feel that power, such a power that I didn't know existed in all the cosmos. And then I was forced back. The next thing I remember, I woke up. I woke up out of a three day coma, being brain dead. I pulled every tube off of me, every sensor off of me. I felt so confined. And the reason I felt so confined is, is who we really are is much larger than this form. So I woke up at 1.11 in the morning. I was checked out at 7.30 a.m. Even though every single department tried to resist and did not want me to go, I, I still signed all the waivers. I got out of there and I went jogging. I actually went jogging that day and had no problems whatsoever. <laughs> I had no residing effects of my death other than I'm a different person now.